So we'll welcome to the hypnotherapy to boost immunity and natural health practices. So as we mentioned earlier, <clears throat> there is one aspect is exposure, being exposed to virus or bacteria. But then why do some people recover quickly or not even get sick and other people tend to have more challenges or tend to pick more things up? So we're going to look at some, what are some natural ways to help your body and your mind work together in boosting your immune system? So first we have a disclaimer. This class is for the purposes of natural health education. Holly Stokes and the Brain Trainer do not diagnose, treat, or cure illness or disease. If you have a health issue, recommended to check with your qualified health practitioner. So nothing that we do here tonight is meant to um, replace what you would you know, normally, your advice that you would normally get from your physician or your doctor. It's more about to just augment your awareness and to even give you some uh, mind-body tools that you can start using. Okay, so when I went through psychology courses in, um, in Portland, finishing up my degree, we talked about a health psychology class I was looking at a bigger model of how our a system interacts for health. What is the model of wellness? And in health psychology, they really recognize that it's not just biology. So our biology is really the system that doctors use in the body's let's say this chemical or adjustment so it does something different. So in the world of Western medicine, they're very much focused on the biology and then to change what the body is doing, to change our biology to get back to health. In the model of biopsychosocial model of health, the health psychology, they're recognizing there are multiple factors involved besides just biology. That it's also our psychology. What is our mind doing that is affecting our body, our biology? And then also recognizing that our social connections, social structures can affect our biology as well. So this is something to keep in mind. And I loved, this really resonated for me when I went through that class because in our Western culture, we've kind of dialed things down smaller and smaller. They call it kind of reductionist thinking. So for instance, one time physicians studied the whole body, but now more and more you have physicians that are niched. So a doctor that works on hearts isn't the same as a doctor who works on feet, right? And so we can recognize these systems, you know, the heart is very intricate, intricate, very detailed, lots of information there. But as we start to pull back from that reductionist thinking, we're also in that process of the reductionist thinking, we're also losing kind of the expansive interactions of the person in their environment. So what I like about this biopsychosocial model starts to pull back and recognize, hey, we're not just biology. We have all of these interactive forces in our life. Our brain is a part of our health and our social connections are a part of our health too. So we're gonna just uh, dial this in a little bit more. So in our biology, we might have inherited some genetics. We might have inherited, I know in my family line, we inherited the gene called the MTHFR gene. And what that is, is the my body, people who have that gene, that gene expression, they don't tend to detox as well as other people. So there's that aspect of what we've inherited through our family lines. Now our health habits, it's not just about genes. And so for a long time, you know, Western medicine, it's like your health is just what you, what you got. It's just from your genetics, from your family history. But we know that our health habits really interact with that. So in fact, people who have the MTHFR gene, they don't have that um, extra ability to detox. So we recognize that there are health habits that can offset that. So if you're able to get in detoxing vegetables, your cruciferous veg vegetables like broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, 
that can offset that genetic deficiency or that genetic, that gene that's uh, turned, turned off there. So we know our health habits can affect this. We know nutrition can affect this. We know our exercise, how much are we getting out? Uh, how much are we moving in the body? And of course, regular sleep can affect our biology as well. So these, this is just to illustrate how many aspects there are going on in our inner model of health. So the next one is psychology. In psychology, we're looking at our mind and how do stress um, affect psychology and also affect biology. So when we are stressed, we know that we have the fight or flight response. And you've probably heard this before, the automatic nervous system, autonomic nervous system, I call it automatic, is one end of the spectrum is fight or flight. And that's when we're stressed, we go more into that end of the nervous system. The opposite aspect is rest and digest. So we know that when we're in fight or flight, we're feeling stressed, our psychology is stressed, but our body physically responds to that fight or flight. When we're in fight or flight, our body releases stress hormones, epinephrine, cortisol, and it gears up to fight off an attacker or run away. So when we're in that fight or flight response, our body is geared up for you know, fighting off an attacker, running away, and it's not doing the same processes that it does in rest and digest. Now in rest and digest mode, what does the body do when it's in rest and digest? Well, digesting, absorbing nutrients, but also in that rest and digest mode, it's replacing cells and it is repairing cells. It's doing its healing and repair and it's also creating antibodies. So the idea is we recognize our psychology, what we think about leads to the stress that we experience, the anxiety that we experience, the worry. Worry is a brain habit, a pattern. If I spend my day thinking of what is the worst that can happen, all of that gets displayed in my mind. If I think about, here's an example. I was in a car, three car accidents in the space of six months. And I started to take on fears and I noticed my brain was imagining where accidents would happen on the freeway. So if my mind is previewing accidents happening on the freeway, that's creating that inner stress that's adding to my anxiety while driving, but it's also putting the body away from that self heal and repair mode and into the stress response, right? So we know that our psychology, what our mind does, interacts with our body at a physical level. And when we're in that stress mode, our body is releasing stress hormones, and those stress hormones are interfering with the body's natural balance. So these are just some of the aspects of our psychology that could also be affecting our biology as well. Oh. <laughs> There we go. And then in our social world, we also know that positive social relationships are a factor in how well our body does, how well we come back to rest and digest. Um, even the smile factor, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, that even when we're meeting strangers, the more that we smile it actually activates some of the muscles in our face that then cause a release of the feel good neurotransmitters in our brain so that we actually feel better and it takes us more into rest and digest. So as we look at biopsychosocial model of health, we're looking at the more we get out of stress response and into rest and digest response, the more in that rest relaxation, we're actually helping the, giving the body the environment to rebalance itself and do its work of self healing and repair work. And there's a good um, point to note about this. So when you cut a finger, it's not the, you know, it's not the band-aid that stitches that, that cut on your finger back together. It's your body's own tissues and cells that actually do the healing. The band-aid just gives that environment for 
um, to keep that area clean so it can do its healing work. So we also want to recognize <clears throat> that our bodies have an innate, uh, uh, an innate map for healing. It already it knows how to heal. And you might have already gone through many experiences of healing, getting sick and recovering, or having an injury. And then the body knows over time how to recover from that or how to correct for that. So let's look at, let's look at what lowers the immune function. We know stress definitely reduces the immune function. We just talked about that with when we're in stress mode, our body is not doing its healing and repair and it's not working on its antibodies. But we also know if we're feeling depressed, that can also affect our immune function. In fact, the center for depression is one expression of stress. If we're not getting enough sleep, that can affect our immune function. Not enough downtime. Um, if you had noticed the news, there are uh, certain cases in, um, I think it's China, where people are overworking even to the point of working themselves to death. So they were just working so many hours, they're not getting that recharge time with their family, they're not getting that recharge time with their body, and they were dropping dead from heart attacks just because of being overworked, not having that downtime. We also know poor nutrition. So if your body isn't getting what it needs, obviously it's not gonna have the building blocks to heal and repair. Um, I was kind of flabbergasted. I talked to one of my doctors and I was going through um, an autoimmune condition at the time and I asked her, well, what should I eat? And she's like, what do you mean, what should you eat? And I'm like, well, what foods are gonna make this, you know, we're gonna aggravate this or make it worse? And she's like, oh, it doesn't matter what you eat. I was aghast. Like, this is a doctor telling you it doesn't matter what you eat. No, your nutrition, the foods that you're taking in, are the building blocks of how your body makes cells. It cuts those foods into particles and uses those to build new cells and tissues. So it definitely does matter what you eat and how you get your nutrition in. Too much sugar can lower your immune function. So this is, I actually found it listed in WebMD. So what's really cool is that a lot, I've got some more research for you as we move through this uh, presentation, but too much sugar, like even a couple of tablespoons of sugar can lower your immune function by about 20%. So especially if you're getting um, diet, so uh, well not diet sodas, but sodas that have 40 grams of sugar, that's more than, you know, a candy bar and a half. So kind of looking at where can you cut back on your sugar is a good idea to look at if you want to boost your immune function. Uh, limiting your sugar, uh, I also teach healthy lifestyle classes and their recommendation, what well, the program that I went through, looking at how do foods affect our body, look for about five grams of sugar per serving. Anything over that is kind of is going to affect your body's insulin responses, your blood sugar levels, and it can also affect this, your immune function. Of course, if life is out of balance, you know, not enough downtime, too much work, um, too much work is the next one, and too much alcohol uh, can also lower immune function. So these are all the things that we already know what to do. Um, creating that healthy lifestyle, making sure we're getting to bed at a regular time, making sure that we have ways of de-stressing or decompressing. And then, so from my background, uh, before I came to the hypnotherapy, I had already certified as, a hip, as an herbalist. And these are some of the uh, herbal cures that we were using to help fight virus, infection, bacteria, flu, um, and I've used them in my life for about 20 years or more, and I've seen amazing uh, responses, you know, amazing results in, that pro in using these. So this is what I recommend that you have on hand, especially during flu season, and especially, um, yeah, especially during the flu season, and to have them in your uh, medicine cabinet. 
so to speak, your um, at-home natural health. Um, it kind of sounds like we have some feedback. So I'm going to try muting everybody. There we go. OK. <clears throat> so here's some quick overviews of this. The first one is pretty well known by now is Echinacea, and that's that purple cone flower that you see on the right hand side there. That purple cone flower has been well known to boost immunity. Um, however, it's something that shouldn't be taken consistently. What it does is it causes the body to think it's being poisoned, so the body actually boosts its immune system in response to that. Um, so it's more useful as like if you feel you've got an infection coming on or you're starting to get a little bit of a sore throat, that echinacea can help your body boost its immune function and kind of ward off what you're getting. So it kind of works at the, the onset. Um, it's also not good to take it every day because that can reduce its effect of um, boosting that immunity. Uh, it acts like a poison mimic. So your body thinks it's being poisoned and it increases its resources for immunity. Uh, the next one is garlic. This is, I love garlic. I think it's amazing. And garlic and can actually has some properties that help to, um, it, it's very antibacterial. In fact, the next page, I have some of this research here from the National Institute of Health has done a really good job at starting to uh, put these natural remedies through clinical trials and to see what it, how is it that these things are working and how can we put them to use or should we, you know, should we put them to use in our natural health efforts or not? So here you can find the research on echinacea, that poison mimic increases the immune response Garlic has properties of both antibacterial and antiviral properties. So this was really cool to see that that came out in the research and it can reduce virus replication. So I love garlic. And one of the remedies that we uh, studied in herbal school was a mix of, for people who are getting strep throat, is that bacterial infection, infection in your throat. But if you mix up raw garlic, honey, and a little bit of cayenne and <clears throat> take it uh, by spoonfuls and letting that honey and that garlic go down your throat, it'll clear strep throat within 24 hours. So that's if it's a strep throat. Um, if it's viral, it might need more, it might need some more natural help. Um, <clears throat> elderberry, elderberry, is also antiviral. Clinical studies have shown it to stop virus cell replication. So how viruses work, they're not really alive. They're uh, kind of like programs. They go into your body's cell and then the cell, they use their body's own cell to replicate more of the virus. And that's why viruses can proliferate in our bodies so quickly. So elderberry has been shown to reduce that cell replication so your body can catch up with it and then its antibodies can um, effectively help to reduce that virus infection. Now honey, in the National Institute of Health, some of the honey properties have been found to be antibacterial and antiviral. So I knew about the antibacterial one, but it's cool to see that the honey is actually of reducing viral cell replication as well. And then cayenne is, I added it into this list because it's also part of that uh, strep throat remedy, the garlic, honey, and cayenne. But cayenne also has really good effects on our blood circulation. And it can also, uh, some people have rumored that it's also good to help with um, getting rid of internal parasites and helping your digestion to be on track and to be healthy. Okay, so we've talked about this a little bit, that we have, it's the stress response when our body is in stress mode, it's not doing repair and uh, healing. 
And so we want to get it more to the, re the relaxation response. So we know stress has what we think about are the things that are causing us stress now, but stress can have physical effects on the body. And so also we want to pay attention to what we think about because that can also relate to those messages that our body is getting and how our body is functioning, whether it's stressed or whether it's in that relaxation and repair. So I like to uh, help people recognize that we have habits in what we do, which are obvious, like, you know, maybe overeating, eating the wrong kinds of foods, um, smoking would be a habit. But we also have habits in what we think and how we feel. And it's those thinking and feeling habits that are feeding our mind, even in an automatic level, that relate to whether we're in that stress mode or in that relaxation mode. So here's one way to start taking control of your mind, is to pay attention to the words that you use. So the words that we use direct our mind and direct our focus. There's a part of the mind that translates words into mental pictures. So think of your mind, you know, one good way to think of it is like a taxi. If you get into a taxi and the taxi driver says, hey, where do you want to go? And you're like, well, I don't want to go to the library. Then the taxi driver's going to say, well, I'll go to the library, but where do you want to go? Well, I don't want to go downtown. Okay, but where do you want to go? So this is part of the disconnect we're having between our conscious awareness and our automatic mind. Think of your automatic mind, your unconscious mind, as the taxi driver. It needs to know what to do. Um, the good way of understanding this is that our words get translated into mental pictures. So if I tell you, don't think about a yellow butterfly because as you do, it will turn blue and fly right out the door. What does your mind picture? It pictures that yellow butterfly. It has to know, uh, it has to picture it in order to know what not to do. So some of the words that are messages that we're giving ourselves can directly speak to the unconscious mind. Your automatic mind, unconscious mind is always listening. So we want to make sure we're giving it clear messages about what we want it to do versus what we don't want it to do. So for instance, I think um, in the current environment, the idea stay safe is okay uh, because it's telling the mind what to do, but also it has kind of a side message that there's actually something to fear. So be healthy might be a better motto or a better trend. Um, but notice kind of the difference. If you're telling your mind, don't get sick, then your mind is focusing on pictures, images of being sick, or maybe the last time you were sick. And so these words actually affect our mind and our unconscious mind is, um, uses mental pictures. Well, the language of the unconscious mind is story, imagery, pictures, symbolism, met and metaphor. So if our mind is creating these mental pictures, they're speaking more directly to our unconscious mind. So keep this in mind. What words do you want to give your mind and to direct it and tell it, what it where to focus and what to do? So even, I am becoming healthier and healthier. I feel good in my body. I recognize my vitality. I recognize my body can handle uh, the things that come up in life, right? So those would all be examples of really positive messages versus don't get sick or <laughs> uh, don't get stressed. Well, instead of don't get stressed, what do you want instead? Oh, I can feel that relaxation and self-healing even as simply as I start to think about relaxing. Okay, so this next screen is social connections. So this goes back to that biopsychosocial model. So we're going to be hypnotherapy. We're going to be working with the psychology of wellness. And um, also the social connections can be a valuable place to be boosting your immune system. As we think positive, as we have positive social connections, that also creates our inner environment 
that spurs that well-being and that uh, tendency for our body to heal. Even greeting strangers creates a small effect. And you may have heard of this um, in other places as well, that when we see other people, even if they're strangers, they're smiling and so we smile in response. And when we smile, then one effect is we have mirror neurons in the forefront of our head that when somebody else smiles, they act as if they're smiling too. And so we kind of copy that. So we also get, when we see people smiling, we also internally, our neurotransmitters respond as if we're smiling, as if we're doing that as well. So even just seeing people and, and smiling, even if they're strangers, can have a positive effect on your immunity. What does that say in the current environment? Well, you know, getting on, uh, online with friends and family can be part of what's helping to create that smile effect and connecting with people positive and supportive. Pets also boost immunity. There's been more research and studies out about that, that even just a few minutes of, of stroking your cat or um, you know, playing with your dog can help relieve that stress and get the body back to that self-healing mode. House plants, just having a few house plants around can also lower stress and increase self-healing. So keep this in mind too, as what are the things that you're doing in your life that can add to your sense of well-being? Are you, do you enjoy your environment, you know, bringing in a couple house plants, maybe you already have a pet, or just making time to meet with family and friends? And if you have that effect of seeing them, like we would on you know, today's call or something, then you have more of that smile effect rather than if you're just hearing your voice, even that can be helpful um, to hear friendly voices and, and refresh those social connections. Okay, so this talks about the layers of the mind. So the layers of the mind, this is an example of an iceberg. We use it a lot in hypnosis, that recognizing there's some different layers into how our mind operates and how we can affect those deeper layers. So at the conscious level, like an iceberg, it's the top part that we see above the water. In the conscious level, that's where we're saying, I am going to do it this time. I am going to get to the gym. I'm going to eat healthy. But then what's really driving our choices every day, what's really driving our car is the subconscious or unconscious mind below the surface. So in psychology, they often call the subconscious the information that's easy to retrieve. Um, the unconscious would be that stuff that's at the deeper level. I even think of it as the unconscious mind is taking in a lot of information. For instance, as where you're going through this presentation with me, you're hearing my words and that's registering at a conscious level. But in an unconscious level, your mind is also taking in other information about the room where you're sitting, the temperature of your body or the temperature of the air, or even the barometric pressure. All of that's just kind of going into the background and our mind kind of filters it out so that we can make sense of things. So I like to think of the unconscious mind as kind of the expanded mind. It houses all our archives, our memory files, and it also houses all of this extra information. But how do we get messages from the conscious level to our unconscious mind? I like to also call it the automatic mind. It's responsible for the automatic habits, patterns, and programs that our mind is running every day. So again, how do we get those messages from the conscious level to our automatic mind? Well, we use story, imagery, metaphor, symbolism, mental pictures more than um, the words. So the words we use are important and they have an effect, but remember the taxi driver, it has to know where to go. Uh, it's not, the don'ts don't translate for the unconscious mind. So we wanna make sure we're giving the mind clear directions about what we want it to do. So we can use hypnotherapy as a way of relaxing the mind system so most people are running around in you know that conscious level call it beta mind the brain wave that's our conscious level that's our active planning goal setting mind but then 
the more that we can get the mind into that rest and relaxation, the more we have that clear space for our mind and we can get our mind on board, we can start giving positive messages to our unconscious mind. Our unconscious mind is responsible for what's running automatically. Well, at that level, it can even um, be in charge of the automatic responses of the body. So that's how we get the unconscious mind on board with updating immunity and updating um, positive self-healing. So we are ready now to go into the hypnosis process, but I'm going to open up the, um, I'm going to unmute everyone.